Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, most of us were here uh, last year, and we were closing uh, on uh, the different activities that we had to highlight the uh, 10 years. Today is 10 plus 1. And uh, the, those events of the 10 years of EFIS were thought more as a way to define the future than to celebrate the past. And in this sense, uh, we had last year, uh, at this time, the uh, presentation of the proposal of the uh, uh, Maria de Maestu by Claudio. And uh, today this is a uh, reality. And it's uh, giving a, a direction of uh, research and different programs to support this research. Uh, we have already at least uh, three people here which have been hired with the uh, Maria de Maestu and uh, more to come. Uh, we have also a junior postdoc uh, program uh, that is ongoing. We are now receiving applications. And also we have also ready for next year the fixed colloquium complex systems. Those are the people that uh, are scheduled for uh, next year. We will have uh, uh, something on climate, uh, something on economics, uh, something on neuroscience, something on complex networks, some fundamentals, and also quantum biology. Now, what uh, we want to do uh, uh, today is to give an, ever, an overview of uh, uh, research at the FIS during this, uh, uh, this year that is finishing now. And we'll do that by snapshots of 10 selected publications. Uh, snapshots means five minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me make clear that those are not uh, selected as our best uh, results in the year, but uh, with uh, some definition of the best. But rather, uh, what we want is to give a broad view of different uh, research topics during this year. I will start by presenting this paper. It's ab uh, about the consistency properties of chaotic systems driven by time delay feedback. Uh, this work was a collaboration with some people that as to be are still in the field, like, uh, Miguel, uh, like uh, me, Miguel Soriano, and Ingo Fischer, who couldn't come today. And also collaborators, uh, they were here in the field, uh, Thomas Jungling, he's now at the University of Western Australia. Nuss Oliver, she's now a product, product manager at Munster <coughs> in Germany. And now uh, Xavi is a postdoc at Femto ST in France. So they have moved away from, from this topic. Uh, the idea of consistency is that uh, how, how do you, it's a measure that quantifies uh, when you drive a nonlinear system repeatedly with the same drive, the response can be the same or not. So the consistency tells you how similar the responses are to a repeated drive. So on top, do we have a pointer here? Okay. Yes. So here we have a consistent response, a repetition of responses, the same. And here it's inconsistent because you repeat the, the drive and responses are different. In an example of a driven laser system, this would be a consistent response where you superpose hundreds of responses. They look the same, all the same. And as you go inconsistent, then the responses become blurry because they are different one to each other. This is a, this is a general concept, the consistency. And we apply it to delay systems. This is one of the fields that we work on uh, in the group. In a delay system, now we consider the drive as the, sorry, the delay part as the drive signal. So we have now an original system and a replica, which is driven by, by the delay system. In equations, it would look like this. And now you want to quantify the consistency in this context of the delay systems. A measure of consistency can be given by the correlations, and here are the correlations of the x, the correspondence with x and y, and the correlation of, of y. And typical of delay systems, you find correlation echoes at the delay time. This is because you have the repeated drive, and this is what we see here. We have correlation peaks at the delay time in the autocorrelation across and, and the autocorrelation of the y. In this work, what we have done is try to characterize and understand, develop a theoretical uh, framework, analytical framework that relate these uh, correlation peaks. These three main correlation peaks, we gave, gave a name to them. One is the alpha uh, peak, defines the input-output response of the nonlinear node. This is the no that's why we call it the, no the transformation correlation, is the, how the node responds to the input. The consistent correlation appears in the cross correlation and it tells you how the delay affects the system X and the delay affects the system Y. 
at time zero. So this is the consistency part. There is yet a, a third uh, delay uh, echo peak, which is called beta, and this is the spurious correlation coming from the fact that the delay signal has correlations, and then these correlations appear as spurious in the autocorrelation of the Y. So these are the three correlation peaks. And the analytical framework that uh, we developed is that these peaks uh, cannot take uh, any value. They are confined to an ellipse. And this is basically coming from an analytical arguments. And these uh, conditions on the beta, alpha, and gamma peaks, this is the amplitudes of the correlation peaks, define a elliptic domain such that the consistency parameter defines the amplitudes of the alpha and the beta. The largest the consistency, the largest the correlation peaks can be. If the consistency is small, then the correlation peaks are, will also be small, the alpha and the beta. This is very general. It works for the continuous system, for discrete maps, and for stochastic systems. So this is a general framework uh, for delay systems. In, one can use this consistency ellipse in general. We tested it in, in the experiments, and with this I will finish. In a laser experiment, we did that uh, consistency experiment such that we have two delay loops. One is the one that creates the dynamics, and the second delay loop is just to repeat the drive such that we have the consistency test. In the experiments, we find this agreement in the correlation peaks, either measured from the autocorrelation or the cross-correlation, so this uh, tells you that there is a preferred agreement, and we found, we found that non-trivial dependence of the consistency correlation peaks on the relation parameters always within, and these correlation peaks always lie within the, the ellipse that we found. In the laser case, these uh, dependencies look rather uh, continuous for all the three peaks, but this dependence can get messy, always within the ellipse picture, and this is the example of a logistic mark we delayed. So to, to conclude, we have defined uh, we have refined the term of consistency in the case of cardioid delay dynamics, Always, uh, we found that they belong always to an elliptic domain, and as a, also uh, we found that there is a link between consistent synchronization to the delay drive. This is uh, related to the strong and weak chaos. And in other works, we found that information processing works best at the edge of consistency in a driven laser system. So the consistent property is very important uh, for our works. So, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Next, we have. Uh, okay. So good morning. Um, the the goal of the of, of this work is is quite simple. The idea is okay. Let's try to get trajectories to, of uh, different marine uh, animals and try to see whether we can identify common uh, uh, features and whether these features can be explained or, or we can identify the drivers of those of those features. So I I would like to just to to stress uh, a few a few. Uh, uh, different features with respect to what we are used. So first the movement is in a fluid, so it's not on land, so that makes a difference. The movement is a three-dimensional movement, so you have movement on the surface or not to some, some layer, but also you have a diving behavior. Uh, you have different physiology, you have many different animals, species, that means that the physiology is different, but not only the physiology, but also the, the position in the, in, the, in the food web is different, you have predators, prey, and that means essentially that you have Especially, you have different researchers that are specialists on different animals and how they move. So this is one of the, 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 the well, the, one of the first problems we, we, we have when we want to do this kind of, of, uh, of projects is because we have to collect data from different researchers. And, uh, and this is why we have a, a big collaboration like, like this one. We have, different, we have 45 different institutions because uh, basically they are researchers from, uh, that are specialists in seals or on sharks or on, uh, whales. So we were able to collect all this data. <coughs> And you can imagine that this has a lot of problems, right? The data comes from different sources. So the way these uh, trajectories have been obtained are different. Uh, the time differences of the spatial resolution are different. Are different, so that means that a lot of, lot of work that one has to do in order to homogenize or to standardize the data, to make comparisons between different, different uh, uh, te techniques. And this has been done 
Well, uh, I think this is important to say that this has been done by Jorge and Juan. They have spent a lot of time collecting the data. So basically, by email, they were collecting data and they have to clean that and to see whether that was more or less uh, good for the for the analysis. They do the data analytics, and so basically, I mean, this is thanks to, to them that this this work has been done, and also to Anna, that Anna helped a lot on on, on making on uh, understanding the 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 result we were obtaining. So this is the data set we finally obtained. As you can see, basically the data collection is, uh, basically is, is three, it's, uh, 30 years. Not all the animals are in this, in this uh, uh, frame, but you have, for example, polar bears you have in, in the last five years, and then you have seals in, in 10 in between, so you have different animals in different uh, time. And uh, in total, we have less than uh, 3 million, but almost 3 million uh, locations estimate, and we have 50 different marine vertebrates uh, that they can be grouped in different families. Basically, the idea was to cover um, uh, many species, many families. Uh, the idea of megafauna is, I mean, it's a term basically to encompass mammals, but also you have birds, so you have vertebrates. So you have, a, 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 for example, you have polar bears, which they are not. Uh, uh, marine, I mean, you, you are, you, they are not marine animals, but they are considered in, in this analysis. And this is basically the, the data we, we, I mean, the, the data we have in different colors, and also the spatial uh, constraint. As you can see, we have a, a good resolution in the temperate areas, but not in the in the in the equator, right? So we have, well, I mean, there is a big hole in in in, in the middle. But for the for the other uh, regions are, are quite okay. So the idea of that, well, you can see here. So the time evolution of that, this is a year from January to December. And what I do basically is I remove the year and I put the data, I collapse the data in, in a single year, right? And this is, this is, this is the kind of, uh, <coughs> right? So you have many seals in, in, the, in the south. Then you have here another elephant seals. You have sharks there. You have whales, turtles. And this is the data we have. So. The first thing, we want to do a simple analysis. We don't want to do something very sophisticated because then we cannot scale the analysis. And what we basically did was this, probably the simplest thing we can think of is basically calculate the displacement in a, in a day. So you have your trajectory, and then you calculate how far you reach in a day. And then you have a distribution of this displacement for each of the, of the animals or for each of the species. And then we can compare these this distributions, right? So basically, we follow two paths. One was to compare the distributions with Komogor of Smirnos, for example, and then we could do a, a dendrogram analysis and, and looking at how far the different, or how can you group the different species. This is in the paper, but I'm not going to focus on that. And the other, the other the complementary analysis was based on, okay, so we have the distribution, we can measure the spread of the distribution, and we do it with the <coughs> coefficient of spread, which is essentially the second moment divided by the first moment squared, right? So basically how spread is the distribution of displacement for each of the species or for each of the individuals. So what we do with this value, we try to find <coughs> which are the variables that correlate with, with, with those values, right? And we identify a set of variables like taxonomy, allometry, life history, home range, uh, many, many of those. And with this analysis, what we found is that there were basically two variables that were able to capture some signal from or some correlation with, with the, 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 the spread of the, of the distribution. We were the species. So species was able to correlate 74 uh, percent, uh, so it's not exactly a correlation, but well, uh, but uh, let's say that it's, it's, it's correlated 74 percent. While coastal affinity is able to explain 21 percent of that. So a species is more or less intuitive that you were expecting something like that. But what is coastal affinity? So coastal affinity is, I mean, how how comfortable the animals feel uh, when they are close to the coast or whether they're on the open sea. So this is very easy to quantify because coast for, for me is, is the place where the topography is zero, right? When you have zero depth, this is the coast. So what we can do is just not to be so strict with zero. So we define coast as the, the area where you have a bathymetry at depth of 150 meters or less. So this is the coast. And then we can define the percentage of coastal affinity, the number of points or the time you spend in this region with respect to the open sea. So this is what we have, and this is the correlation. Well, these are some examples for different species. <coughs> and what we can do is, in order to show that this is, this is the case, so for example, what we do here is to plot the, coastal, the um, coefficient of the spread 
for points that are considered open ocean, so with a, a depth of larger than 150 meters, or where they are in the coast. And where you can see it's systematically where you find a, a, a systematic tendency to find lower values for open ocean and larger value for that. So taking this together, I mean, basically the idea here is that when you are in the open sea, you are transiting and you go straight. And this is also captured basically with the distribution of angles, right? So when you are in the open sea, you basically go straight. So this is the movement, and this is what. While when you are in the coast, the distribution of angles, how you turn, is more is more uh, uh, homogeneous. And that's that's basically it. So the idea is that different animals. So even for for single animals, this is also true. That, uh, that uh, when you are clo close to the coast, your movement is, let's say, is more complex. While you are in the open sea, the movement is straight. And the convergence means precisely that. that irrespective of, 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 of your family or the origin of your species, you are able to adapt to the, to the complexity of the topography of the, of the envi environmental conditions. And in this case, is the, is the topography. Thank you very much. OK, this is a, this is a work <coughs> done with people in, in Utrecht. Uh, Hen Distra, who will be a visitor next um, January, and uh, Kinji Feng, a postdoc there, and Peter Notebun, he was a master student that uh, is in Hutrek, but he spent here uh, about four months last, last year, no, two years ago, and this is when he did most of the of the work I will I will I will show. So this the title is uh, something about El Niño and machine learning. So let's uh, what is El Niño? This is a phenomenon that occurs in the in the equatorial Pacific. This is the equatorial Pacific. This is uh, America and the and Australia and Asia here. Uh, the standard normal conditions are that there are some winds called trade winds that blow in that direction, and this makes that the okay the thermocline is more or less a line of constant temperature in the ocean. This means that essentially here the, the water is colder. In the Asia and Australia, the water is warmer, and also it's more humid, so there is more precipitation, and here is drier. This is the standard condition. But from time to time, it happens something happens that the winds uh, blow less intensely to the to the west, or or even to the they blow to the east, and then the thermocline deepens, means that the, it will be hotter in America and dry uh, drier and and colder in Asia, so the precipitation patterns move. This, this, is, this, uh, this thing is one of the most important um, sources of climate, climate variability in interannual time scales. Uh, in fact, we know, we, we know that this is just one phase of, us, of our oscillation, which is called uh, the El Niño Southern Oscillation, in which the, I mean, the winds and the thermocline and the atmospheric conditions go uh, from this state to this state, which is called La Niña. So, the, so from, from this state to this state, so that there is a, a big shifting in the conditions in the, in the Pacific. Uh, and this is... Now we understand that this is a, comes from a hot bifurcation of the couple atmosphere and ocean system. Uh, so it's a, a, either a, a weakly damped oscillation or a slightly uh, excited limit cycle, but always very close to the bifurcation and then very noisy. So this is a very noisy oscillation coming back and forth. And because it's very noisy, the period is, is not very well determined. So this can record in two years, or in five years, or in six years, or in eight years. So this is a quite irregular phenomenon, quite noisy. And then people is, is trying to understand it because it has impact in many in the Pacific for sure, but also in many other places of the Earth. It's the, so in, in, in between years, uh, time scales is, is the dominant climatic phenomenon. So, so this is the temperature in the Pacific, and then people quantify the, the El Niño conditions by by measuring temperature in some area with different indexes. This is uh, well, there are several types of. Of indices, so this, is, and then when the, when the temperature, when some average temperature here in some area is larger than 0.5 degrees uh, above the mean, and for more than five months, people say there is one El Niño, and when the, the temperature here is smaller than 0.5 below the average temperatures for more than five months, this is called La Niña, yeah. and then this is this index, which is the temperature in some area, is going up and down. And then you see when, when the, the, the fluctuation is larger than some threshold, then you say that you have El Niño or La Niña. This, so, and then, this, as you see, this is quite irregular. 
and people has tried has has uh, used many many things to 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 obtain to try to to understand and to predict this. And okay, what we have done what we have done is trying to predict it by using uh, artificial intelligence uh, methods, neural networks in particular, and in particular trying to go to large to large uh, to large uh, prediction times in more than six months, which is very uh, quite complicated. This has been done by many people. So what we add. We try to identify variables physically based from the physics of a, of a particular model, and also we try to we explore the use of network variables. Network variables mean that we use we compute networks on climatic variables by cor, by by joining together places with have high correlations in climatic variables. Sorry, this is time, so I have to finish. <laughs> and okay, so so this is what we have done, and this this is the the. The method we have uh, we have used a combination of some linear regression method called ARIMA, which takes into account temporal correlations, and also a neural network. Of we have tried, tried several structures, uh, up to three layers and up, uh, three hidden layers and up to four neurons per layer. And essentially, what uh, the, the new novelty of our approach is trying to find to to check. Uh, different variables that can be input to the to the neural network, which, which of them are better, and we the many of them physically based, and we see that many of them physically based in one uh, in one uh, percolation, uh, percolation indicator that we developed with Jose and Victor and Victor Aguilus and Victor Rodriguez uh, some time ago is a very good uh, variable to input to the neural network and to predict the the result. And this is the result. I finish here. The, this is the comparison of our me so uh, black is the is the observed time series for El Niño, and red is one of the best forecasting methods, which is called CFSV2, and blue is our method uh, prediction at different lag times. In, in, in all cases, we is better. We did this calculation in uh, April 2017. Then we make some prediction. This is the CFS. V2 prediction system, which is an ensemble prediction, so it has lots of scatter, but this is the, the predicted uh, by then. And the blue is what we predicted, and this is what uh, this is the, what has happened during this year. So we we were quite quite good at predicting by using this combination of linear regression and then the residual is predicted by some by some neural network, which has an. Uh, and the important thing is that the variables are motivated by physical insight into the model and by using some properties of connectivity by, by neural networks. So this is... Thank you very much, Emilio. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present this work, uh, Thermally Driven Out of Equilibrium to Impure Decondo System, that is a bit different from the previous one. Uh, uh, this work has been done in collaboration with uh, Miguel Sierra, who is going almost uh, to defend his thesis in the next month. Um, also with John Sulin, uh, who was a postdoc here for a long time, and now he's back to Korea. And uh, well, it's about a double dot systems uh, that present uh, condo correlations. And uh, in this work, what we wanted to, to do was to just to hit one of the reservoirs, electronic reservoir, and to uh, low temperature in the other one, and to see what happens uh, in the transport of the charge and the heat uh, through the system. So um, first, uh, what is called the FED? Uh, here we have a, a, a spin that is localized in a quantum dot, and then is coupled, is tunnel coupled to the uh, to a kind of uh, two electron, uh, two uh, two-dimensional electron gas here that is a, a Fermi uh, reservoir. Fermi uh, is, is is described by a Fermi distribution. Um, this part, and then you have a lot of electrons that are delocalized, and they try to screen the spin of this uh, localized uh, electron here in the quantum dot. So this is for a single quantum dot, and what uh, we see uh, at the end is that, uh, for instance, in this uh, geometry, a quantum dot coupled to a reservoir of electrons, then is that the, the transport through this system 
if you couple another reservoir here, is almost perfect if you uh, lower the temperature because the electrons want to screen the spin of this impurity. Okay, so this is what happened in the conde effect, in the normal conde effect in a single quantum dot, that the conductance, the, the, the electrical transport through the system is perfect due to this uh, phenomenon. So now we have two uh, quantum dots and then there is also tunnel, tunneling between the two of them and uh, then we can have two different uh, regimes of transport. One is that you can develop a condo peak here and a condo peak there and if the tunneling coupling between the two uh, is, uh, is high enough then you can have a kind of uh, uh, perfect uh, transport through the system um, and this happens when the um, when the tunneling between the two dots is, is, is sufficiently uh, high. Uh, but uh, it can happen that the two spins, they can be locked into a singlet state uh, and this uh, is uh, a situation that occurs when the, the exchange interaction between the two spins uh, is larger than the condo uh, exchange coupling. In that case, the, the transport is locked and, and then the two spins want to form a singlet state between, between them. So we are going first to analyze the situation where you can have a condo effect in each of these uh, spins and then depending on this uh, value of T, uh, we are going to uh, explore how is the electrical and the heat transport when you apply a temperature gradient between the left and the right dot. And at the end, what we see is how this situation changes when the uh, exchange interaction, interaction between the two spins is high enough. So in the first one, well this is the, the paper that we uh, in which we address this problem here. And uh, in the first case, uh, we are able to uh, identify three different regimes of transport uh, depending on how is the interdot tunneling uh, coupling constant and how is the gamma, which is the tunneling between the reservoirs and the dot. And depending on uh, how uh, uh, is this T compared to gamma, then we can identify uh, uh, the weakly coupl coupling regime, the intermediate coupling regime, or the strong coupling regime. In the strong one, then we can say that the condo temperature, which is, the, is a, um, a magnitude that uh, indicates how large is the um, binding uh, between the electrons in the reservoirs and the spin on the dot. Uh, if, the, if we are in the strong coupling regime, then we can see that the, as long as theta, that is the gradient of temperature, uh, increase, then um, the two condo temperature, the two quantum dots, they uh, get to lower the condo temperature. So the condo effect is uh, making uh, weaker and weaker uh, as long as the, the, the gradient um, increase when the interdot tunneling regime is larger than gamma. On the other uh, regime, in the weakly coupling regime, when the two dots are <coughs> almost isolated, then uh, on only the condo effect is suppressed in the case where the heat is uh, applied to to, to one of the reservoir. So if, if we are heating one of the reservoir, then the condo is suppressing there, but not in the other uh, reservoir that is, uh, let's say, cold. And this only happens when T is smaller than this gamma. Then uh, we have also analyzed 
the electrothermal current, which is the electrical current driven by this uh, temperature gradient. And what we have seen is that depending on this T, we can have uh, different behaviors for this, uh, this response of the electrical current to the thermal gradient. Also, we have analyzed uh, the heat flow in this system, and we have seen that uh, it can display a thermal diode uh, behavior. And finally, uh, we have also checked when we are able to get uh, antiferromagnetic singlets between the two spins of the dot or condo singlets, depending on uh, the value of the um, of the super chain uh, coupling between the two uh, spins of the dot and the uh, condo coupling that is given mainly by the condo temperature, and we can say that uh, this uh, the transition between one phase to another, uh, as long as we increase the the gradient between uh, the two temperatures in the reservoirs is given by this expression. And in this expression, we can uh, calculate uh, almost analytically these this, this condo scales. So at the end, we are able to give some uh, value for this transition depending on the, um, on the temperature gradient. And this is a summary of what I said before. Thank you, Rosa. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little about the paper we published this year in NeuroImage, which is called High Frequency Neurons Contribute the Finding Effective Cognitivity in the Brain. And this work was done in collaboration with uh, Ares Paris and Ingo Fischer, who are here, Santiago Canals from the Institute of Neuroscience in, in, in Alicante, and Alireza Balizadex and Sara Esfahani from Iran. So the emergence of flexible information channel in the brain is a fundamental question because if we understand better how it was, we can design probably better communication channels, in particular in areas like uh, information communication technology. It is known that the, the hubs, the structural hubs, played an important role distributing information, but the question is whether the dynamics can play a role in distributing it. Esto no funciona, ¿no? no. So in the, already in 2016, it was shown by a group in France that if you have two networks or two subnetworks that are connected and both of them have certain oscillatory frequency, by changing the frequency of one of the subnetworks, you can reverse the information flow. In this study, what we do is we have a, a linear chain of mutually coupled neuronal population as uh, drawn here. The, the populations are excitatory coupling among them, and then we are going to see what happens if, if we put information, how information can propagate. So the first we have to show is how is the dynamical regime we have for each population. This is the, the <coughs> raster, raster plot in which uh, every dot corresponds to one neuron pulsating in the population, so it's clearly seen that there are some synchronization here in the population, so there is a, sorry, that is, if you do the Fourier transform of the, of the signal, you see a clear, spect a clear peak at about 40 hertz. But what is also important is if I change uh, the current of the neurons, if I put a higher current into some of the neurons of the population, then this frequency moves, shifts to the right, so the frequency increases. So to start with, we study the response to a small perturbation. We have the, all the layers now connected, oscillated with the same frequency when isolated. When we couple them, we do it excitatory. And what we see are two things. If all the neurons, or if all the population fire at the same more or less frequency of 40 hertz, the signal hardly propagates. So this perturbation can hardly propagate into the network. But if the, if the population receiving the signal or this perturbation has a higher frequency, which is 2. hertz higher than the other, so it's about 42, 44 hertz, then the signal propagates better which indicates that if I have a high frequency node, signal propagates better into, the, or at least a perturbation propagates better. So what would happen if we have a signal? So the idea is the following. If I have a, a neuron, a layer, sorry, layer six, which has a higher frequency than the others, and I put a, a signal into it, the signal propagates almost to the whole network. Certainly the, the response is higher in its, in its own network, in its own layer, but it can propagate to all the network. But what happens if I put two signals? I put now one 
in layer 5, one in layer 7. Layer uh, 5 is the high frequency node, layer 7 is a normal node. So you see that the signal that apl is applied into the high frequency node propagates to the whole chain, but the signal applied to the low frequency node or the normal node can only propagate to the right. That means away from the high frequency node, which means that the high frequency node is blocking the information. Actually, it can only transmit information in one direction and it's blocking information coming from other side of the network. Just to show that this is very general, we took a, a connecton network, which is a network, structural network of part of the brain of, of monkey. Here we have 47 nodes. One node here is number 20. This is a hub, a structural hub, very connected. The number 16 is a normal node with not much connections. And we do the double signal transmission. So if we take the number 16, which is not, it's a normal node, not very well connected, and I increase its frequency, I identify which is the best detuning for the information to propagate. And if I study how the, the information is propagated, we see that this node becomes a, a dynamical hub. It means that the information goes out from it and receives almost nothing. Because if it's positive, means that the information is flowing from the node to outside. And the, the, the structural hub doesn't feel anything special. It looks very similar to what is without the, the other node. But if I do the other rest and I, I increase the frequency into the hub, into the structural hub, the situation certainly increases a lot. Now the structural hub becomes not only a structural hub, but also a dynamical hub. All the information that I injected into it is spread to the whole network, while the node number 16, which now is a normal node, doesn't change much as it was before. So to conclude, let me put everything together. The high frequency node can play the role of a source being highly influential for signal propagation, determine the direction of signal transmission, and so the effective connectivity within the network. The results were confirmed during different studies like network response and, and mutual information indicators, and is robust for multi, uh, multiple structure. And this change in the frequency is easily to be done, so information seems to be easily to be root within the, the brain. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Well, uh, I mean, the first talk that, that uh, when the, the talk that Victor gave, uh, we were following animals, let's say, and then you have the, the maps with uh, where people, where animals were. Uh, this is a similar kind of study, but with people. Okay, so <laughs> we don't have the seals; we have uh, some people moving in the city. You know? And uh, well, I mean, it was done by all these uh, people over here. Some of them were here, like uh, Fabio and Maxim, and uh, and some others were in other places, but have been also here as visitors in in certain points. No, so. As I was telling you, they, this question is about people. And then uh, there was this paper in Science uh, a few years ago uh, trying to, to figure out which are, were the flows of people uh, ca crossing countries. So as I said, this is migration, OK? That now is quite old fashioned, but OK. <laughs> so <laughs> the question that they decided in this paper was that actually they have a lot of information in census, in service, and so on, and that uh, they could reproduce these this flows and actually say that the flows have been maintained constant in the last uh, 20 years, approximately. No? Of course, this is not the impression that some other people has on the order. But then uh, there was these uh, these papers uh, that came out uh, last year in Nature, saying directly that the data of movements of refugees and migrants are completely flow. So it's completely a mess. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, due to the fact that actually the surveys are done with, uh, with uh, I mean, you are asked people. And then if this people is not uh, legal uh, legally in the country, of course they are not going to answer or, or you are going to get very little information. No? So then what we decided to do was le let's use um, uh, online uh, information. I mean, instead of putting a tracking device, <laughs> uh, actually the humans have the, the tracking device by themselves. And then let's see, let's see if we are able to uh, figure out in cities if um, these people are more, let's say, segregated than the local population or not. No? So Because if they are... Uh, when they are uh, living in the same areas as the local population, that means that they are somehow well integrated. With this definition of integration, eh? because there is, in integration, there is a lot of definitions and a lot of issues and blah, blah, blah. But this is a spatial integration, okay? Um, for that, we look at the, at the messages in the, every of these uh, cities, and then we detect those that are uh, done in languages that uh, correspond to migration communities. Uh, okay, so then what we try to do is to find out which is the residence areas of these people, because they usually uh, tweet with relative frequency, and then you check uh, uh, where they are tweeting during the nights, which is typically the place where they, where they live. No? Uh, by doing this, we also introduce a, a metric uh, that try to separate with a, it's a kind of uh, entropy measurement that try to separate uh, how well or how badly integrated they are in the space. Okay, uh, I, we, once we have that, uh, we can say uh, for every 
every community, uh, every city, uh, we can plot this thing with the different community uh, uh, of immigrants, and then in, in here uh, the color corresponds to this uh, measurement of how well integrated they are. Okay, so the darker it is, the better integrated they are, and actually the first box is always the local community. Uh, and then uh, the longer you go in this direction, there are more and more communities and they are less and less integrated. The question is that, for instance, here in London, most of them are very well integrated and then you don't see big differences respect to the, to the British population, which is the locals in this case. No? Uh, and then what we, we find out is that actually you can divide, divide cities in, in three sets. Uh, ones are the ones that are, have a, a good number of, of, um, of migrant communities and they are relatively well integrated. Then you have uh, those over here with very little uh, migrant communities uh, like for instance in the one in South America they are only the local population or some other populations that speak Spanish that can be from other countries <laughs> okay? uh, but they speak the same language so we were not able to separate them uh, but there, there are some others like uh, for instance here you have Toronto that were kind of a surprise because I was expecting in Canada to have a, a, a more integra integration uh, a, a approach to this, uh, to this issue and actually the, most of the migrant communities there are relatively isolated in space Okay, so that means that actually there are some ghettos for uh, for these uh, for these people, uh, and then you have something in the middle. So here we have New York, Paris, and many of the big cities in the in the world that, of course, are not exactly the same. And uh, the main difference is how this uh, this integration decays. No, so essentially you can see the green the green uh, cities it falls very fast. Uh, the blue ones slower, but I mean always it will always go down. So the only question is that <laughs> how it does it. No. Um, this also allows us to, to produce this kind of maps where we have uh, languages and, uh, and countries. In this case, we can aggregate the information of the different cities of, of every country and try to check which are the, the communities that integrate best in respect to the others and which are the ones that integrate worst. Okay? Uh, this, these are uh, sort of tools to, to check out uh, where you have uh, problems, essentially. No? And uh, actually, the problems typically is, uh, emerge where there is a strong differences uh, culturally, reli uh, in religion, and this kind of thing, which is something that you could expect. And let's say this is a way to quantify uh, this, uh, these issues. Um, and well, this was mostly it, uh, because since it was only five minutes, I didn't have uh, <laughs> much more things to, to show. Okay? Okay, thanks. So first of all, I would like to thank Maxi and Jorens and Adrian for organizing this uh, session, which I think is uh, quite, na quite, quite nice. So the title is Mapping the Americanization of English in Space and Time, and this has been done in collaboration with uh, Bruno Gonsalves from New York University, Lucia Loureiro Porto from, uh, from here, from Baleares, from this, um, the, the, the philology department, and Jose, uh, who you know. Okay, so, um, as you know, uh, languages are not homogeneous, okay, so it, it means that um, um, they, they are, um, they exist in different forms, okay, so even in a single, in a, for a single language, um, uh, you observe variation, okay, these kind of variations are present in different, uh, let's say, in different types, different ways, okay, you can present variation uh, depending on the context, okay, so it's not, uh, the way you speak is not the same uh, for having I mean, with your friends that with your PhD advisor, hopefully. Um, also, there is, uh, let's say, a social variation, okay? So uh, people uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, belonging to lower class uh, uh, speak differently. People compare uh, people with uh, higher class. It doesn't mean that they speak better or, uh, or, or let's say, or worse. Because um, I mean, linguistics is, is, is a science, so it doesn't uh, should not be concerned with, with judgments. Okay? It's just mm -hmm. like a, a reflection of uh, of the uh, of the affair of, uh, of the things. And also, there is a variation um, which is, let's say, connected to the to the place. Okay, this is what people uh, normally call dialects, and um, uh, linguistics. Um, they prefer to call uh, varieties. Okay, so here we we focus on two varieties of English. Okay, uh, two major uh, varieties, which are British and American varieties. Of course, English have uh, many more dialects, but these are the two most important ones. For instance, uh, in spelling, uh, you know that um, a, a British speaker would write color, ending with O-U-R, and then an American speaker would um, write this as uh, ending with O-R, okay? It's exactly the same concept, the same meaning, but then written in different forms, okay? 
In vocabulary, uh, they also refer to a, to a given entity, in this case, a lift or elevator with two different words, exactly the same thing, but uh, two different variants. Okay? Lift uh, for British English and elevator for, for American English. So what we did first is to collect a collection of these alternations. Okay, we have pairs okay, for either uh, spelling or vocabulary items. And then um, once we collect this, we go to, uh, we have a Twitter data set for let's say um, uh, messages written in English. And then it is possible now to calculate this uh, factor or let's say variation factor, variability factor for a given word, for this uh, uh, alternation, and, and a given cell in the map. Okay? And this is uh, thanks to the fact that uh, in this um, Twitter data set, it is possible to, to know the, um, um, the location, okay? because they are geo, geo tracked uh, uh, tweets. And then it is possible to uh, calculate, let's say, the ratio of, for, let's say, for a given word and a given cell, a given place in the map between American and British forms. Okay? And this is the results uh, classified by countries. Okay? Uh, we obtain, um, let's say, trivial results. Namely, in the US, they like American uh, English. And in the United Kingdom, they like British English. But then they, we find something which is uh, interesting. Um, in mostly all uh, European countries, except uh, for Britain and Ireland, um, people prefer to use American forms, both for spelling and vocabulary. Okay? The difference is um, b uh, between spelling and vocabulary is, uh, is, is also interesting, okay? because uh, for spelling, people tend to, let's say, be more British, maybe, maybe because these people learn this in school. But for words, for vocabulary, people prefer to, to use more American words, okay? maybe because they borrow from, from songs, from movies, uh, whatever. There are also some uh, funny um, uh, phenomena, like for instance Canada. Canada is kind of a mix um, territory, which they, they use uh, British um, uh, spelling and American uh, vocabulary. And some other, even in some former British colonies, the tendency to adopt uh, uh, an American dialect is uh, stronger and stronger. This is like a, like a snapshot uh, for a few years uh, in Twitter. Now we change the data set and see how this evolved with time. Okay? This is um, data taken from, from, Google, uh, from Google Books. Okay? And you can see that uh, how the Americanization for books edited in, in the US increased, okay? there is some, let's say, non-monotonic behavior, and we think that uh, all these uh, changes are connected to some historical event, okay? like the publication of the first American dictionary, or, for instance, now, uh, let's say, uh, 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 the fact that the internet is becoming more and more popular since the 90s. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, David. Okay. So this is the uh, stochastic pair approximation. Let's see what the model what has been done mostly here with the collaboration of Adrian Carlo, who was also here, and now is a postdoc at the Institute for New Economic Thinking in Oxford. Now, this is a technical paper, okay? So this, uh, if you really want to solve a binary state model on a network, you need to read this paper. <laughs> Otherwise, you can go to lunch. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so what we've done is to pose a, 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 general, a general method a general method to solve uh, a system which you have n stochastic variables, which can mean two states, and those variables interact uh, such that the rates to go from one state to the other depends on the state of the other ones. We have taken as an example the Kirman model. Kirman model is a, is a model which has been used to to, uh, to model the, the behavior of brokers in a, in, a, in a stock market, in which you can go from the state zero, which means to sell. Uh, to buy, uh, whatever, to means to sell in the stock market to the state one by the comparing what other people do. So you simply have a turn to do things just by yourself or to copy the state of the other neighbors. 
Okay, this is the Kirba model. And here we're interested in to, uh, to analyze how many people are sane or buying a moment, which is the correlations of the, of the different, uh, different, uh, different options, to find the fluctuations, and to find the density of active links to whom you can copy. If everyone is having the same option, you cannot copy anyone. Okay, so this has been a very active field of research, and what we've done is to study this, this, um, this process. Uh, here, I say it's a very, in principle, what you can do to decide that is to write the exact equation for the average and the correlations. These are the equations that you need to do. And you say this is hopeless. I mean, there's no way you can solve that. Okay? Although you can do some approximations at this level, and you, can, you need to read a, this other paper by, by the same authors uh, for an approximation to deal this way directly. Now, you can do the crudest approximation, which is to consider that there is only one variable. So you replace the whole population by a single variable, which gives you how many agents are buying or selling. Okay, this is the original work by Kirman. It's a very simple approximation. Being simple, though, is very, very, very useful because it predicts correctly the quality feature of this system. Is that it can go from a state in which there is consensus, so all of them are doing basically the same thing, then to switch to another state in which they all buy, they sell, they all buy, they all sell, or to a state in which they are alternating randomly between the states. Okay, this is predicted by, the mean, by the, this mean field theory. How to go beyond that such that the network structure is considered? So the idea is very simple, and it's the following. Instead of considering all the variables in the system, which is a mess, instead of considering one variable in the system, which is too simple, we consider a mesoscopic level of description. So we take as our variables the number of agents in a state one which have k neighbors in the lattice. These are our set of variables, plus the number of active sites. Once you do that, once you have chosen what to do, the rest is simple. You need to write the master equations at the level of this, at this microscopic level. And we can do that, and to do that you need effective rates. Those effective rates are using obtained using the, what is called the pair approximation that was developed before by Bathgett and, and Negilot a few years ago, and which assumes basically that the probability of a link being active is independent of the probability of another link being active. Okay, once you have our equation, our variables, our rate, we write the master equations, and we solve the master equations. To solve the master equations, that we can do it at this level, we use two approximations. One is something which is very, is, can be applied to other models, which is to expand the solutions around the deterministic solution. And the second, which requires a little bit more knowledge of the model, and we have only been able to do it for the for the water model, is to expand the solution around a dynamic attractor. Once you have decided the variables and the two method to approximation solutions, then you can go to the to the results. And we can see here, okay, there are too many plots here. We can see these are the dots at the simulation results, at the continuous line is the result of our approach compared with the dash and the dotted lines, which are the results of other approaches. So it is quite, quite, uh, quite, a good, uh, quite a good agreement between the results of the simulations and this is for the density of active sites. You can also look at the, at the fluctuations and so on. So remarkable, all this fast, after you have all this, it turns out that the structure of the network can be just simplified by defining an effective number of agents. So in most networks, the, the, what is it? The, uh, the, um, the results can be explained as if they were all 12, but with a different number of agents, which is quite interesting. Thanks, Raul. And we so this work uh, started, started, started in 2016 with a SIR fellowship uh, uh, of Albert Cabot. And it was in collaboration with all these authors, mainly from here. And uh, it bridges two topics, collective dissipation and quantum network. So I will just say a few words about the topic and then uh, select few results. Normally, when you have a multipartite system, you can have dissipation taking place individually in each of the components of the system. Or you can have collective dissipation. That is dissipation that occurs in one collective degree of freedom. For instance, like it can be the center of mass of the units of your system. This kind of collective dissipation occurs, for instance, in the case of super radiance. That is when you have atoms that are emitting light. And these atoms are nearest that the emitting radiation wavelengths. And this is a possible scenario. So where units are very, very nearby. 
And the other situation in which you can have this kind of correlative dissipation is uh, considering, for instance, also in the case of atoms, when they are dissipating in a structured environment, like a photonic crystal. In this case, you can have collective dissipation even if you take your units far apart. And you can actually have quite exotic scenario for the dissipation. So the second, topics, uh, the second topic is quantum network. And quantum network have been actually uh, studied uh, uh, recently in a different context. For instance, there are works considering networks of states uh, in which the, the links are given by the, for instance, by the components of the density operator. Then we have the quantum internet in which nodes of the network are connected by exchange photon, photons. And in this case, what we are going to consider are networks of interactions. In this case, the nodes are connected by physical forces. For instance, these are two examples. This would be the modes of a frequency comp signal that are related between them because they are interacting with a nonlinear medium. And the other case is the case of these uh, kind of superconducting uh, waveguides in which there are um, microwave photons that are capacitively coupled between them. So the aim here was to consider this kind of complex network suffering, collecting dissipation. And I've selected three results. There are many more in the paper, but just were three of them. So when you have uh, collective dissipation uh, in a system, when you have dissipation in a system, typically you have also the coherence and quantum property are degraded, as nicely represented by the infographic of Adrian here. And uh, in general, what can occur is that you can have some degree of freedom that if you have collective dissipation, actually remains uh, screened by the dissipation. So you can have a, ni a noiseless subspace in which, for instance, property like entanglement, coherences, and quantum correlation can be preserved. In the simple case of two degrees of freedom, uh, two harmonic oscillator, for instance, you can have that if they are coupled, they uh, will have a center of mass degree of freedom and the relative position. If the center of mass is dissipating, the relative position can remain actually uh, free of noise, so it will be noiseless. And in, in general, if you consider configurations that are very regular, like lattices, you will have many of these noiseless modes. What happened is that the, this is not the case when you have some kind of disorder. And what we have studied in this world was the case of topological disorder that you have in network and disorder in parameters. And uh, just three words about the results. First, we have looked at the abundance of this. And we have seen that actually these uh, noiseless subspaces um, disappear uh, with the variance of the degree distribution in the network. And you have considered different networks for this. The second result is that they have a quite strange, peculiar feature that is uh, the typically these noiseless modes have always an even number of components. So these are kind of breeders. And we have seen this both when uh, the mm, network we are considering is purely connected, but also and more surprising when this is actually fully connected. And uh, in this case, uh, actually, you actually you have that all the nodes are connected between them, but the region in which you have noiseless, these noiseless subspaces are quite, quite small. And the third result would be about synchronization that has been studied in the last year also in the quantum regime. And actually, we have reviewed this in a, in a recent book chapter. And uh, one of the scenarios to have synchronization is when you have collective dissipation taking place in your system. So this can induce synchronization. So for this part, we are considered now networks with uh, not only topological disorder, but also disomogeneous uh, parameters. And we actually have found different uh, is um, instances of synchronization. S uh, stationary synchronization that is fragile, like the noise, the size spaces, but also a transient synchronization that is instead uh, rather robust, uh, present in many cases. And, uh, um, and these are the results, and we go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Roberta, and thanks for all the speakers.